Okay, well, uh, my thanks to the uh, organizers of this uh, program for the uh, challenge of presenting a complicated topic to a postprandial audience. Um, I have to start <clears throat> with an apology that uh, the talk is probably not as general a user's guide as the, um, as the title implies. Um, there we go. So, really, what I want to talk about is the use of esophageal, the rationale for the use of esophageal pressure monitoring uh, for the management of peak in ARDS. And um, the, this slide was intended to uh, introduce the thin line between the benefits and the harms of um, PEEP in ARDS, but in preparing this talk and in editing this talk, I realized that there's also a thin line between clarity and confusion. So I will do my best to favor the former. So PEEP and ARDS have been fairly tightly linked since Ashbaugh and Petty described ARDS more than 50 years ago. Most of us use and think of PEEP in the context of defense of blood gases and of oxygenation, but perhaps at the cost of under-recognizing its mechanical effects. The good PEEP increases the size of baby lung ARDS, it reduces unventilated, increases recruitable lung, it makes the lung more homogeneous. It does so at the potential cost of reduced cardiac output, and mechanical lung injury. Um, as Lao Tzu suggested, there is a thin line between benefit and harm, and the art is in defining the best balance, uh, achieving our goals and avoiding harm. It is not the purpose of this talk to discuss the many ways in which we regulate PEEP, but I want to focus on the physiology underlying the disease, its management, and the rationale for using plural pressure measurements to guide setting. So, the physiologic definition of ventilator-induced lung injury is a critical amount of unphysiologic stress and strain applied to the extracellular matrix of the lung. The term villi was introduced in 1993. You can see that in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a run of significant papers describing the flavors of ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, I want to leave you remembering that biotrauma is probably just as important mechanical aspects, Billy, um, that a lung that is injured in any of these ways can still produce pro-inflammatory cytokines that worsen the lung injury that we're trying to treat. Um, the art here is to stay, uh, is to avoid atelectasis and to avoid overdistension, um, each of which cause stress strain on the lung. Now, those are simple one-syllable terms, but let's see how familiar we are with them. So, here's our introductory question. Pulmonary stress in the ventilated patient is best defined as excessive plateau pressure, excessive tidal volume, force opposing the force of inflation, or shear force from cyclic recruitment and derecruitment. So please vote. Obviously, we had a reveal there. So, um, good, everybody is paying attention to the spoilers. So, let me move on with uh, definition. Can I advance? There we go. All right, so, strain is a volume-related term. It's defined as the tidal volume divided by FRC. Uh, we can abbreviate that as V0. A total lung capacity breadth from FRC 
creates a strain of approximately two. It's been shown in animal work that that's the practical upper limit for strain before lung injury and death occur. It's worth noting practically, though, that V0 is a clinical ele elephant in the room. It's difficult, to it's difficult to measure and is almost never assessed in a clinical setting. Failure to account for tidal volume normalized to FRC may contribute to the disappointing results of many interventions to control lung injury. Stress is a Newtonian concept. It's the force generated by the pulmonary extracellular matrix in response to the distending force applied by a breath. That distending force is transpulmonary pressure. Stress and strain are linearly related by the specific elastins of the lung. That's defined as the transpulmonary pressure at which FRC doubles. It's somewhere around 13 centimeters of water in humans. Elastance, just for clarity, pressure divided by volume. It's a measure of stiffness, and it's the inverse of compliance. Why do we use elastin? It's mathematically easier to play with in these equations. Stress is quantified as the product of strain and specific elastin. So if you follow this slide, really barotrauma and volutrauma are two sides of the Let's switch over to the disease. The pathophysiology of ARDS magnifies the risk of injury from mechanical ventilation. Luciano Gattinoni and his colleagues in Milan have shown the ARDS lung is functionally small more than it is stiff. We lack a good bedside measure for FRC. It's not predictable from our height and gender-based nomogram. Because FRC can and is severely reduced in ARDS. Even a lung protective tidal volume of 6 mL per kilogram of predicted body weight can still cause damaging strain. The second significant hazard imposed by ARDS is its inhomogeneity. There's a spectrum of unventilated, potentially recruited, uh, recruitable, normally ventilated, and abnormally aerated lung. The border zones between atelectatic and ventilated lung turn out to be especially problematic. They're hazardous areas which multiply regional stress for any given degree of strain. Atelectatic areas may cyclically open and close with ventilation, adding an element of shear stress. All of these, each of these, can be associated with biotrauma and inflammatory cytokine production. Now, Jerry Mead in 1970 produced uh, a bioengineering analysis of the pulmonary skeleton and calculated that these border zones between ventilated and unventilated lung can be subject to as much as four times the stress for any given tidal volume as normal homogeneous lung. Uh, subsequent empirical work has shown that the real stress factor may be probably closer to 2 to 2.5, but the bottom line is a safe distending pressure may produce local stresses of 60 to even 120 centimeters of water. And this is clearly dangerous and potentially lethal. Now the top cartoon uh, illustrates what happens when you take support out of um, a load situation. We have a one kilo, uh, um, a uh, 100 gram load, 10 fibers, the load to each fiber is one kilogram. Knock one off, the load becomes 10. Knock two off, it's 125. Non-participating alveolar units, as they drop out, are going to increase the load on the units. Now, let's see if we can make these cartoons on the bottom work. Um, on the left, we have normal homogeneous lung. And it expands and contracts a little bit, but it does so. Here's your ARDS lung with an area of collapse. Notice how you have a disproportionate amount of stretch, stress, strain on the target. So analysis of CT scans from ARDS patients has shown us that 
up to a quarter of lung volume can be described as a stress raising borders. It's a reasonable therapeutic target then to make the lung as homogeneous as possible. PEEP is one way to accomplish that. Proning is another. So what should we be looking at? Transpulmonary pressure is the most physiologically relevant measure of distending pressure that's applied to the lung, and therefore strain and stress. Transpulmonary pressure is defined as the difference between alveolar pressure and pleural pressure. At zero flow, if we ignore resistance, pressure at the airway opening can be substituted for alveolar pressure. There are a few important additional considerations. Plateau or peak pressures, which are defined as airway pressure minus body surface or atmospheric pressure, is not equivalent as pulmonary pressure. Equations underneath the line, lungs. Um, An airway pressure is the sum of transpulmonary pressure and pleural pressure. Transpulmonary pressure, although it refers only to the lung, is still a global measurement and it's insensitive to local inhomogeneities imposed by pathology. Finally, based on its definition, the take home of the slide is in order to know transpulmonary pressure, you're going to need to know pleural pressure. So, does our, do our traditionally used measurements, airway pressures, plateau pressure, does it really reflect lung stress? Loring uh, et al. analyzed data from their 2008 clinical study and showed that plateau pressure gives a very different impression. Um, we have here um, transpulmonary pressure in buff and plateau pressure in white. See, the number that you're getting in plateau on your ventilator is very different than what the lung is actually. It's much higher. Abdominal pressure, and I think uh, Mike Connor uh, presented this well this morning, abdominal pressure also influences pleural pressure and can bias airway pressure. Measuring airway pressure, pleural pressure, and transpulmonary pressure while increasing abdominal pressure with CO2 insufflation in a pig model Kubiak showed that plateau pressure progressively overestimated the white line, progressively overestimated lung distending pressure, the buff line, uh, as pleural pressure increased. Both of these studies demonstrate that perhaps we are, a, perhaps we can use higher peeps than we think possible based on our airway measurements. Um, now, what about our lung protective setting. Are these actually safe? Do they guarantee that we avoid injuring the lung? There are two papers from Gattinoni's group about 10 years ago that suggest that uh, these settings may not be guaranteed to safe. Tarani, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, ventilated 21 ARDS patients with 6 mLs per kilogram tidal volumes. He looked at their chest CTs, and he looked at cytokine. Although plateau pressure stayed under 30 centimeters of water in all cases, nearly half of the patients showed CT evidence of hyperinflation and evidence of elevated production of inflammatory cytokines, despite nominally safe ventilators. A year later, David Chumello from the same group varied tidal volume and PEEP while measuring airway, uh, pleural, and plateau pressure. He showed that for any given plateau pressure, pulmonary stress and strain were highly variable. He attributed this variability uh, to variability in lung and respiratory system elastance and variability in FRC. Safe tidal volumes could result in unsafe stress and strain and seemingly unsafe tidal volumes still be physiologic. So why do airway pressures fail to accurately reflect lung physiology? 
basically because their respiratory system rather than lung pressure. They include the chest wall as well as the lung. The chest wall functionally includes the abdomen as well as the thorax. Functionally, it's mechanically in series with the lung. A pressure applied to the airway moves both the lung and the chest wall. The proportion of movement between lung and chest wall depends on the elastin. When the chest wall is flexible, it's a low elastance, more of the applied force distends the lung. When the chest wall is stiff, high elastance, more of the applied force goes to moving the chest wall and less to the lung. The wide range of clinically observed ratios of lung to respiratory system elastin leads to a wide range of transpulmonary pressures for any observed airway. The graph on the right illustrates the point that a safe plateau pressure can be associated either with a safe or with a dangerous pulmonary distending pressure, depending on the proportion of respiratory system elastins due to the chest wall. And also that a stiff chest wall is effectively lung protective from the standpoint of stress. On the flip side, if the pleural pressure is high enough to exceed alveolar pressure, transpulmonary pressure can become negative. A negative transpulmonary pressure is associated with alveolar collapse and with atelectasis. During mechanical ventilation, the lung may be subjected to cyclic recruitment and derecruitment of collapsed units, presenting the risk of shear stress, atelect trauma, and biotrauma. In critical illness, elevated abdominal pressure, as we saw this morning, is frequently seen. Chest wall elastins and pleural pressure increase. This means that airway pressures overestimate transpulmonary pressure. Ventilator settings guided by airway pressure can lead to undersupport and the risk of atelect trauma. If airway pressures are an inadequate guide, would transpulmonary pressure be a better target? Again, if we want to know this, we will need to know pleural pressure. Now, pleural pressure is rather difficult to measure at the bedside certainly not directly. Esophageal pressure, however, measured with a balloon positioned in the mid-esophagus, was shown seven, almost 70 years ago to permit a window on pleural pressure. It has been shown to reflect average effective pleural pressure. The change in esophageal pressure tracks the change in pleural pressure better than absolute pressure, and tracks pleural pressure in the upright individual in regions immediately adjacent Balloon. With this information, it becomes possible to follow pleural pressure and calculate transpulmonary pressure in the ventilated. There are limitations, however, and caveats to esophageal pressure. First, pleural pressure is not uniform. Gravity imposes gradients such that pleural pressure is more positive in dependent lung and less positive or negative in non-dependent. Local disease may impose further inhomogeneities in pleural pressure. You can see from the figure on the right, these physiological differences can create up to a 10 centimeter of water error in esophageal pressure as an estimate of regional pleural pressure. This is not inconsiderable considering the scale of transpulmonary pressure that we're attempting to monitor. Add to that the fact that the ventilated patient is usually not upright, but rather some variation of supine. This effectively adds the weight of the mediastinum to esophageal pressure, typically three to seven centimeters of water, leading to a possible overestimate of non-dependent pleural pressure and underestimate of dependent. Some authorities suggest using a single correction factor to account for weight. Um, so can a single number practically describe the whole lung? Jump. Which one of the following statements true. Lung protective settings can reliably protect ventilator-induced lung injury. Esophageal pressure is a clinically accessible method to measure pleural pressure in the ventilated patient. Airway pressures accurately monitor stress, and a low chest wall elastin is effectively lung protective. Please vote.
Uh, I need to do the reveal. Well, the answer, the answer is B. Let's see what people. And, all right. So moving right along. So the practical implication is we can measure pleural pressure. We can apply this to transpulmonary. Um, the idea was first mentioned by Gattinoni in the early aughts, uh, championed by his group. Um, there have been two small clinical studies using different approaches uh, to the translation of esophageal pressure to transpulmonary pressure. Both suggest clinical benefit. Uh, Talmore in Boston, in the journal, uh, directly calculated pleural pressure. Uh, Grasso, uh, working in Italy with Gattinoni, uh, imputed pleural pressure from elastance ratio rather than uh, directly calculated. Now, in 2013, the Boston group reviewed their clinical data and recalculated their estimate of pulmonary pressure using the two methods, direct measurement and the elastance ratio. They found the two were incompatible. Uh, and in some cases, they carried opposite therapeutic implications. So this raised serious questions about how and whether esophageal pressures could be used to guide mechanical ventilation. However, a um, group in Toronto at the end of last year um, did a fairly study uh, using, uh, using pigs and cadavers. They measured regional pleural pressure with implanted uh, wafers and compared the two methods. They found that the direct method tracked dependent pleural pressure closely, um, whereas the elastance ratio method tracked non-dependent pleural pressure. So the implication is that perhaps you could use the direct method and expiration to find the low end and you could use the elastance ratio and end inspiration to avoid over So does it really make does it really make a difference? Does treating does treating to uh, pulmonary pressure work? Um, we had two studies as of, of 2018, the two uh, the two studies that I've referred to already, uh, the Boston group using a direct measurement. Uh, where they had a non-significant trend uh, toward mortality, a redu reduced 28-day mortality, no changes in ICU or ventilator length of stay, um, whereas the Italian group looked at H1N1 patients, 14 only. Um, these patients were referred for ECMO. They were able to avoid ECMO in half by using esophageal pressure guided peak. Now, this obviously indicated a bigger study was done. The Boston group went back, designed a bigger study, uh, EPVent2, which came out several weeks ago in electronic form in JAMA. Um, they targeted end expiratory uh, pulmonary pressure that was barely positive and a reasonably constrained and inspiratory. Uh, their control group was keep FiO2 table from the oscillate uh, HFO trial. Uh, this really was pretty close to the high PEEP ARDS. Unfortunately, the study was largely uh, there were no changes in ICU length of stay, vent free days. 28-day mortality mechanics or the incidence of barrow trauma. The only thing they reported was a decrease in the need for rescue. So does this mean that um, uh, the idea of using esophageal pressure is dead? Maybe not. Um, I think there is some methodological about uh, EP vent 2. They used only the simple method of measurement. Uh, they did not account for strain, uh, strain did not account for C. Um, transpulmonary pressure as a whole lung measurement, the 
It's not accounting for local stress. Uh, but maybe high peak arts net is all we really need. Um, Gatnoni has suggested maybe we don't even need to worry about these sophisticated measures, that what's really important is to strive for a homogeneous ventilator setting with uh, proning. Uh, with uh, So right now, I think there are more questions than answers. Uh, I think you want to look at some of these caveats if new literature comes. Uh. So to summarize, stress and strain play a central role in lung injury. Um, the inherent mechanical ARDS relate to the baby lung and um, make the risk of ventilator higher. The goal in PEEP is to reduce atelectasis and spontaneity while avoiding the best way to do this is to not. Our traditional airway pressures may not be adequate. Um, transpulmonary pressure may or may not be helpful. We know it. Um, if you're going to monitor your pressure, if you're going to do that, you do need oral pressure, esophageal pressure to do it. And how best to use these data at the bedside region. Well, at least you seem awake. I hope uh, I hope that was helpful. <laughs>